All right. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. All right. Does it show up on the camera? Can you tell? You can't hear it. Okay. It should be picking up. Okay. All right. So we had 10 spies that went into the land. 12 spies, excuse me. 10 of them came back with a bad report. It was just supposed to be a reconnaissance mission. It wasn't supposed to be a mission of discouragement, which is what they turned it into. And notice the 10, they didn't discourage just themselves. They discouraged almost the whole nation. It was a powerful thing that they did for the evil because Yahweh had already said that he's going to fight for us. It wasn't just us coming in to do this. It was Yahweh that was going to do it. Now, there were two that had a good report, and those two ended up making it into the land. And not only that, their children were blessed as, as a result. So we have a decision to make. What kind of person are we going to be? Are we going to be like the ten that look at the problems and think the problem is greater than Yahweh and discourage others in our doubt and unbelief? Or are we going to be like Joshua and Caleb and know that Yahweh is going to fight for us and encourage the brethren? Because we're coming up on some times that we're going to have to know that Yahweh's faithful. Things are drawing closer to the end, and we're going to see some things like what we saw in the wilderness before. So we're supposed to be learning from the examples that were set before us. So two of them look past the natural. They look past what just their eyes were saying. And they remembered Yahweh had already taken out the greatest army on earth for our forefathers. They'd already battled Og, the giant, whose bedstead was nine cubits, which works out to 13 and a half feet, depending on what size cubic you, you use. It could, be, could have been almost 18. So this guy was huge. He was massive. He was the last of the giants that was in this particular section of the country, and Yahweh had already delivered him into their hands. They'd already gone in with the War of Midian and not lost a single person. Let's read it real quick, Numbers 31.1. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves for war, and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for Yahweh on Midian. A thousand from each tribe of the tribes of the Israel shall you send to the war. So there were recruited from the divisions of Israel, one thousand from each tri tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. Then Moses sent them to the war, one thousand from each tribe. He sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, just as Yahweh commanded Moses. And they killed all the males. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Avi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Skipping down to 48. Then the officers who were over thousands of the army, the captains of thousands, the captains of, of hundreds, came near to Moses. And they said to Moses, Your servants has taken count of the men of war who were under our command, and not a single man of us is missing. Therefore we have brought an offering for Yahweh, that every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets and bracelets, the signet rings, earrings and necklaces, to make atonement for ourselves before Yahweh. They didn't lose one man. That is like unheard of. But because they were walking in obedience to Yahweh, his blessing and protection was with them. All 12 of them saw that, but only two of them remembered it. The 10 just got their eyes on the giants, got their eyes on the big walled cities, and thought it was bigger than Yahweh. You can't just look with your natural eyes at the problems. Problems are going to look big. We've got to look past that to the solution. Go ahead, Johanna. Now let's read about Og. They remembered that Og was defeated, Deuteronomy 3.11. This is from our Torah portion as well. For only Og, the king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. And that was just talking about in this particular territory. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land, which we possessed at the time from Oer, which is by the river Arnon, and half of the Mount Gilead and the cities thereof gave I to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the rest of the Gilead and to all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, which I, unto the half-tribes of Manasseh, I gave it to the half-tribes of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, 
with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. Now, there was a bunch of giants at one time, but the sons of Lot actually came in and cleared out most of them. Og was the last one that was left on this side of the Jordan. Now, on the other side, there was a whole bunch of them as well, and that's what the, the 12 spies went in and saw on the re reconnaissance mission. There was a lot of giants. There weren't going to be any bigger than Og, though. This guy was anywhere from 13 and a half feet to maybe 18 feet tall, depending on the size of the cubic. He was massive. But it's not by strength and it's not by power. It's by my spirit, says Yahweh. He was nothing for him. As we continue on, it says, And the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, who had, was one of them with a good report, this is 45 years after this particular time, Son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which Yahweh said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. And that's the key. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed Yahweh my God. From the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And we said, saw that Caleb had it in his heart. The others had wickedness there. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed Yahweh my God. And now behold, Yahweh has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since Yahweh spoke his word to Moshe, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. And as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which Yahweh spoke in that day. For you heard in that day of how the Anakim were there. And the Anakim were giants. And that cities were great and fortified. It may be that Yahweh will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as Yahweh has said. And Joshua blessed him, and he gave Horeb to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, on this day, because he wholly followed Yahweh, God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, the massive giant. Then the land had rest from war. So Caleb knew the power of Yahweh, and at 85 years old, was still defeating giants. Now, the rest of the people, it was everybody that's 20 years old and older that died in the wilderness. Some of them died at 60, 40 years later. Psalms 90 talks about how that we're dying at the age of 70 and sometimes 80. That was because of the curse in the wilderness. Yet we see here Caleb, just the opposite, 85 years old, still killing giants. There's a blessing that goes with being zealous for the things of Yahweh, knowing that he is faithful, that you can trust him. And there's a curse for just the opposite. You'll die young if you don't believe him, take him at his word, and study his Torah as he's teaching. We're going to see. Yahweh proved himself again when they took Jericho. Well, actually, it's Deuteronomy 3.21. Uh, and I commanded Joshua at this time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your God has done to these two kings, so that will Yahweh do to all the kingdoms through which you pass. You must not fear them, for Yahweh your God himself fights for you. This is the last verse of our Torah portion. He started out saying that Yahweh's going to fight for you. He ends his Torah portion saying that Yahweh will fight for you. It's not by strength. It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says Yahweh. We have to take it in his word. It doesn't look like it can be taking place naturally. But Yahweh supersedes the natural laws. He's an awesome and a holy God. Go ahead and scroll down. When we took Jericho, Joshua 6.20 says, So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, that's shofar, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox, sheep, and donkey, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go to the harlot's house from there, and bring out the woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city with all that was in with fire. Only the silver, the gold, and the vessels of bronze and iron they put in the treasury of the house of Yahweh. Yahweh claimed all the booty from this particular 
the first city, the first fruits basically, all the gold and the silver was his. It says, And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot in her father's household and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel this day and was in the lineage even of King David and our Messiah. Because she hid the messengers whom Yehoshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now they learned their lesson when they went to spy out Jericho. They didn't come back with a bad report. They came back with what Yahweh told them. I mean, the people were afraid. They, they were in fear. They knew Yahweh had split open the Jordan. They crossed out the whole nation on dry ground. They all heard about it. They knew the power of Yahweh. The enemies knew it. And now these people that went in to spy it out, they knew it too. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before Yahweh who rises up to build the city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So Yahweh was with Yehoshua, and his fame, fame, his fame spread throughout the whole country. So you know who occupies Jericho today? The Arabs. There's a curse on them for it too. Joshua trusted that Yahweh would fight for him always. Joshua 23.9 For Yahweh has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For Yahweh your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. He, we're in covenant with the creator of the universe. One of us can put a thousand to flight. We saw it when Jonathan went to war with the Philistines, him and just his armor bearer, and they went and routed the whole army, and then Israel came in and joined them. It doesn't matter the numbers. We saw it over and over in Scripture. So we know that Joshua was able to always trust Yahweh, but why was this possible? It didn't just happen. There was a reason. In Joshua 1, 1, it says, After the death of Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, it came to pass that Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moshe, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the great river Euphrates, that's up in Lebanon, way up further north than what they have now, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I be, will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the Torah which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right hand to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the Torah shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. He knew what Yahweh told him to do. But he also followed in obedience with the instructions Yahweh gave him. He continued to meditate in the Torah day and night. Now it talks about in the New Testament, it's almost looked on like a bad thing. Whoever is circumcised is a debtor to keep the whole law. That makes, they make it sound like it's a bad thing. Only here it says if you do it, you'll have good success. You'll, be, you'll prosper in whatever you do. Yahweh wants us to follow his instructions. It's his definition of love. It was given for our good. And as Joshua did it, he was able to succeed time after time after time. So Joshua was successful because he heard Yahweh. He followed the instructions that Yahweh gave him. He was obedient, continued to meditate on Yahweh's Torah. His obedience kept the door open for Yahweh to be able to bless him. Yahweh wants to bless us, but we have to do our part. We have to renew our minds with his word and with his Torah specifically. Joshua was not the only one that fought giants. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He's a shrimp compared to the old king of Bashan. He's only nine feet tall, maybe a little bit more, actually nine and a half feet probably. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor and his legs and bronze, a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. A shekel's about the weight of a quarter, probably. 600 of them's going to be pretty heavy. And a shield-bearer went before him. 
Skip down to verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David knew the covenant. And he was saying, this is a man that does not have covenant. I don't care how big he is. He is an uncircumcised, uncovenanted man that you don't need to be afraid of, guys. But again, they were letting their eyes make the problem be blown out of proportion, even though the guy was big. There's a saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. David proved it. <laughs> now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him because of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go to war against this Philistine to fight with him. You're a youth, and this is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, I struck it, and delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by the beard, and I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, Yahweh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go! And Yahweh be with you. Saul saw that David knew the covenant. He knew his God. He knew Yahweh would fight for him. Saul didn't know that. But he could recognize it when he saw it. So what made David so successful? Why did David know? Again, Psalms 1.1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. It's brainwashing ourselves with Yahweh's word, his instructions contained in the Torah. It's just like doing martial arts. You practice so much that you just get to the point where you react when you're in a situation and you need it. It's the same thing with the Torah. If we meditate on it, we're going to think the way God thinks. And when we come into a situation, we're going to react just like David did, just like, just like Joshua did. Anybody that meditates in the Torah, we can program our thinking to think the way God thinks. And that's what he wants us to do, but it doesn't happen on accident. We have to choose. We have to choose to be like the two and not the ten. Because it's easy to be like the ten. Our eyes can deceive us. Things can look bad. But if you don't keep your eyes on Yahweh and you don't know the power of the covenant that we walk in, you can let your physical eyes overwhelm you. It's easy to do. We have to look through the eyes of faith. We have to look at the results. We have to know that our God is faithful. We have to remember the deliverances he's brought us through from the past, just like the children of Israel, just like the two spies did. They're there. We've seen miraculous healings in our families. We've seen miraculous provisions for finances. We got to go to Europe when there's no way in the natural that we could. And, Yahweh has blessed us, but we have to remember He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will continue to bless us. He doesn't change. If we're doing our job, He's going to do His responsibility. It's a covenant. Now look at what Deuteronomy 28 says. It says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your God, to observe carefully all His commandments which I command you today, that Yahweh your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of Yahweh your God. Now notice he said, doesn't say seek the blessings. He says, seek Yahweh, obey his commandments, and these blessings will come on you and overtake you. If we do our part, he's going to do his, heart, his part to see that this happens. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall you be in the basket and in your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall be you when you go out. Yahweh will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yahweh will command the blessing on you and your storehouses, your savings account, and in all to which you set your hand. He will bless you in the land which Yahweh your God has given you. Yahweh will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of Yahweh your God and walk in his ways, then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yahweh, and they shall be afraid of you. And Yahweh will grant you plenty of goods, and the fruit of your body, and the increase of your livestock, 
and in the produce of your ground, and the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers to give you. Yahweh will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give you the rain in the land in its season, to bless all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Yahweh will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you today, and be careful to observe them. If we do our part in walking in obedience, learning the Torah, being zealous for the Torah, loving the Torah, and then walking in obedience, Yahweh's going to bless us. What did you say, it said something about blessings fall. How did you put that? Blessings fall you? Well, it, it says it in Deuteronomy 28. It says, if you do these things in the book of the Torah, then all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. You don't seek the blessings. That's being taught in the prosperity movement today. We don't have to seek the blessings. Even what Yeshua said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's the principle that comes from Deuteronomy 28. We seek Yahweh. We seek to keep his Torah because we love him because it's all about love. He says these blessings will come on us and overtake us. We just do our part, and he will do his part. He is faithful. Brother Ilya? When you were talking about Joshua, you read uh, verse 3 there. I have a, a great, it's, it's an amazing connection between Joshua 1 3 and Genesis 3 14. Well, I'll just read it if you don't mind. Yeah, let me get you the microphone so it'll come up on the uh, camera so the people on the internet can hear it as well. The parallel is. Well, this is really. <laughs> Daniel's is still on? Our inheritance, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a great connection between Joshua. Okay, so it's on. Yep. Okay, so Joshua 1 3. Every place that your soul, okay, there's em emphasizing the soul of your foot shall tread upon that I have given unto you, I said unto Moses. Every soul that your foot, of, of your foot shall tread upon. Yep. So if we go to Genesis, uh, Genesis 3, let's see. I'll start at 3 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Yep. We see a it's almost I'm not I'm not sure if it's gonna be a prophecy or a gospel, but from that moment Satan's the deception is happening because he knows every the sole of your foot steps upon, that's your possession. Yep. So he's trying to steal our possession. And Yahweh spoke then, and he's speaking again in, 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 in Joshua. Yep. Saying that whatever the sole of your foot touches, that is yours. Hallelujah. The deception is happening. It started from that very beginning. That's why Yahweh says, you shall bruise. How do you say it again? You shall crush his head, and yep. he shall bruise your heel. Yeah. Yep. There's an amazing connection. Yeah. I want to point that out. Hey Amen. That's good. Go ahead and hold the microphone, Brother Tom. Hallelujah. God is faithful. That's the thing. If we do our part, He's going to do His part. He wants to do His part. So we've got to do our part. Brother Tom, go ahead. And I, I, I was just noticing that I don't see nobody's nationality. Yeah. This is, this is for everybody. This is covenant. Everybody that obeys His word. It don't matter what your nationality is. That's correct. You don't have to be a physical son of Abraham. When we left Egypt... There was a mixed multitude that went with us, and we all became the nation of Israel. It's a covenant people. And it doesn't matter if you're a natural branch or you've been grafted in. There's one people of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. That's the thing. We are one. So the blessings are there if we do what's required, which is walk in his Torah, delight in his Torah, and there's nothing that we can't accomplish because we're blessed when we're walking that way. We've got a covenant with the creator of the universe. So the giants in our lives, they're not any bigger than Yahweh and his Torah. I don't care what comes at us, what we might see with our eyes. Yahweh and his word will overcome anything. Go ahead, Johanna. We can do it just the same way that Joshua and David did. The giant circumstances or people or whatever it might be. If we keep our eyes on Yahweh, on his Torah, and the Torah made flesh, Yeshua is part of that. He says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. So let's look at Hebrews 12.1. We've got to keep our eyes on the Messiah. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
That was all the heroes of our faith in, in Hebrews 11 it just talked about. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeshua kept his eyes on the end result. He didn't get his eyes off on the natural and just get all discouraged. Even though he could see it, he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. It wasn't going to be any fun. But he looked at the end result, and that's why he went through and was able to go through what he did. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. We're going to go through some stuff. But we can do it because Yeshua did it and he's given us the power. He's given us, we've got the Torah. We've got a covenant with Yahweh, the creator of the universe. And we're going to be able to make it. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yes, yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of Yahweh. No, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom Yahweh loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So there's going to be some things that even Yahweh brings on us that aren't going to be pleasant. But we need to realize that he's only got our good in store. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For whom the son, what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So in other words, you better expect Yahweh to be dealing with you in some areas in your life. Furthermore, we have had uh, human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. We need that. And he knows how to get the junk out of our lives so that we can walk holy before him. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So Yahweh is pruning us. He's, he's purging us. He's getting the things out of our lives that block the holiness that we need to live in because without it, we're not going to be able to see Him. There's things in our lives, even though we're, we're branches in the vine of Yeshua, John 15, Yeshua says, I'm the vine and you're the branches, but my Father is the vine dresser. He purges and prunes us so that we can bring forth more fruit. It's required. There's things in our lives that have to be gotten rid of, but it's done by the Holy Spirit and it's done in His timing. We can't prune or purge one another. Give the microphone to Ember. Uh, you know, before I uh, came into Hebrew roots, I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced this, but uh, I used to question my faith because I thought, oh, I believe. Why can't, and I pray for more faith and uh, I read the scriptures and, and I just felt like I was a, a failure. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I came into Hebrew roots and understand I was missing the instruction book. Yeah, we've been told it's irrelevant. And so. It wasn't that I was lacking the faith, I was lacking the instruction. And so it's really made a big difference in, in everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Faith is something that everybody looks for. You know, I, I can remember when I first got saved, I used to think, what is this faith? Man, I need more of it. Mm -hmm. But what you discover is that when you start getting into the instruction book, and you start acting on the instructions. Yep. When you start putting it to action, that's what brings you the faith. That's it. He says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But it's not just hearing it with your ears. It's Shema. It means to hear and obey because it's the obedience. First, we have to hear it so we can meditate on it and, and do it according to all that's written therein. If we don't know it all, we can't do it all. So first, we have to hear it. But then, just like you said, as we act it out, that's what brings the blessing. That's what plugs us into the source. So he was wanting to bless us, but we've got to do our part. So we've got to meditate on it day and night so that we can do according to all that is written therein. So we've got to keep our eyes on Yeshua and his Torah. And as a result, look at Philippians 4, 11 through 13. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in what state I am to be content. The outside circumstances don't matter. Paul's realized that. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound, to be rich, to be poor. 
He wrote this in prison, by the way. So he was being abased at the time. He was locked up for teaching the truth everywhere. And in all things, Technical difficulties, please stand by. <laughs> A little further. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Messiah who strengthens me. Hallelujah. Now, who is Messiah? We know him as Yeshua, but we also know him as the Word made flesh. Yeshua and his Torah cannot be separated. They're one. So we do it because we're meditating in this Torah and we're listening to the voice of the Spirit. He says, when I leave, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to send the Comforter. And He will teach you of all things that I've said. So His Spirit, it's just as important that we learn to hear His voice as well. But we do it through the Torah also. That's how we can discern the spirits. Does it line up with the Torah? Paul understood this fact. But also John, in John 4, 4, he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. There's no giant that can stand up with who lives in us. And we can let that force and that power come out through meditating in his Torah and believing and taking him at his word. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible for him. So overcoming giants doesn't happen on its own. When we entered the land, we still had to bear the sword. We had to stick it in their gut and chop their heads off and everything that we had to do. Yahweh was with us. He gave us the strength and the power to do it, but we still had to walk it out. We still have to do it today. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Messiah Yeshua, and we know we're in him according to 1 John chapter 2 because of keeping his commandments. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we have a choice to make. We still have flesh and, and a nature that wants to do what it wants to do. And we have to crucify it daily. So we have to choose to walk after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. And in the previous chapter, he, he explains this law that's warring in our members that wants to lead us down that destructive path. It's called the law of sin and death. For what the Torah could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So what are the, the things of the Spirit? Go ahead and scroll down, please. In Romans 7, the previous chapter, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. There's a contrast going on here. We've got our flesh that's carnal, and then we've got the Torah that's spiritual. So how could we be carnal, sold under sin? Because we've not removed, renewed our minds to the Torah. Once we do that, once we embrace Yeshua and the law of the spirit of life, he gives us the Holy Spirit, which according to Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, it says, there's coming a time when I'm going to take out your stony heart, I'm going to give you heart of flesh, and I'm going to put my spirit within you so that you can walk in my statutes and keep my judgments to do them. The Torah is spiritual. A carnal person can't keep it, but he gave us his Holy Spirit to empower us to walk in obedience so the blessings would flow so that we could defeat the giants in our lives. So we do it through renewing our mind. We do it by embracing Yeshua the Messiah and He giving us His Holy Spirit to empower us to actually do this. For to be carnally minded is death. If all you're doing is filling your mind up with the junk of this world, it leads to death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Scroll down, please. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the Torah of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Even though we're born again, you can still choose to walk after the flesh and not be pleasing to God. You can still get the same reward with the unbelievers. We have to choose to continue to walk after the Spirit. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, he's not his. You have to be born again, he told us. And if Messiah is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's part of the blessing that comes on us and overtakes us. We'll be fruitful in our bodies and, and we'll be not be sick. He'll take sickness and disease out of the midst of us. It's because of the Holy Spirit, because of meditating in His Torah. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We have to choose. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We have to hear His voice. And we know it's His voice because we know the Torah and it lines up with the Torah. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. In other words, he's not promising us a bed of roses. There will be suffering. We're in a war. We're fighting the good fight of faith. But nobody can stand against us as long as we do what he's told us to do. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. If children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah, that's equal heirs with Messiah Yeshua Himself. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of this present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that's what we're to keep our eyes on. Just like Yeshua when He endured the cross. For the earnest expectation of the cre uh, creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. When our bodies are made new, that's when the salvation will be complete. Right now we're saved by hope, as we're going to see. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for all the saints according to the will of God. That's the groanings we've talked about before, the speaking in other tongues, a language that we don't necessarily know with our intellect. But the Holy Spirit is praying through us the perfect will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those that are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now we're conformed to his image as we continue to do what we're supposed to do. Meditating in the Torah day and night. Walking after the Spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. These are all conditional promises. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. As far as he's concerned, it's a done deal. He's seen the end from the beginning. He knows the end result. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. Now Satan tries. He's the accuser of the brethren. But Yeshua is our lawyer, our attorney. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. Satan can't get, can't get by that. Who is he that condemns? It is Messiah who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Just as Yeshua, when he went to the cross, he knew that wasn't the end. 
That was just a way to get to eternity. And that's how it is for all of us. If he calls us to be martyrs, it's not the end. It's the beginning. And not all of us are going to be called that way. Some of us are going to be slaying giants. It depends on how he calls us. The original apostles, most of them were put to death. One of them they tried to kill, but they couldn't kill him. He made it. <clears throat> for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, and you could put giants in there, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is the Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. We've got the victory if we keep our eyes on the end result. Satan can't take it from us. We can defeat ourselves if we're like the ten and we just look at the circumstances and the situations. But if we keep our eyes on him and his Torah, nothing can stop us. We have to choose to walk after the Spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a conscious choice. We do it by walking in obedience to His Torah. As we see in Deuteronomy 30, 8, it's a choice. You will again obey the voice of Yahweh and do all His commandments which I command you today. Yahweh your God will make you abound in all the works of your hands, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If we do our part, if you obey the voice of Yahweh your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the Torah, and if you turn to Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you. It's not too far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. And Paul adds in Romans chapter 10, that is to say, to who's going to bring Messiah down from the, the, the above? He's equating Messiah and Torah. Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. In your mouth, as we're meditating on it day and night. And in your heart, that you may do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love Yahweh your God and to walk in His ways and keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply. He wants to bless us, but we've got to do our part first. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turn, turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them. I announce to you today that I sh you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess, just like the ten, which result in the death of the entire, almost the entire nation. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love Yahweh your God, that you may obey His voice, and you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to give them. So we have to choose to make Yeshua our master and obey His Torah. And this isn't irrelevant to us, even though we're not in the land today. When Yeshua comes back, He's drawing us back to the land. When the temple's rebuilt, that's going to draw a lot of us back to the land so we can be that, in that place of protection that we've talked about in the past. And when Yeshua comes back, he's going to divide the land up again. We're going to get our inheritance again. This is totally relevant to us and probably in our lifetime. We have to choose to be encouragers of Israel, not discouragers. We have to be like the two and not like the ten because it's a choice. And we can encourage one another. We're commanded to do so. Because we can do great things together. One of us can put a thousand to flight, it talks about. Two of us can put ten thousand to flight. There's a synergy when we work together and we're encouraging one another. This is how we choose life. He says, I said it before you. Life and death. Blessing and cursing. Choose life. We have a choice to make. Every one of us can make the right choice. We have to choose to walk after the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a battle that we're in. Daily, we have to take up our cross daily, crucify the flesh, and follow the Master. But the end result is that we're going to be equal heirs with Yeshua Himself. Our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's nothing that is too difficult for us if He's calling us to do it. We have to hear His voice. We have to obey. 
but it's easy. Like it says in Philippians, now it's God that's in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It just takes our decision to go and cooperate and do work with him, and he will bless us. Let's all make that decision to choose life. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity, the privilege of coming and studying your Torah, of learning your ways. We thank you, Father, that as we walk in obedience to your word, the blessing, blessing flows and overtakes us. We don't have to seek the blessings. We have to seek you. You are the blessing. You are our creator. And we just give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that is yours. Continue to lead us and guide us this week. Help us to keep our eyes on you and not any giants that might rise up in our way. Because you are the answer. I thank you, Father, that you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yevarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmerecha. Yair Yahweh, Panavelecha, Vihunecha. Yesa Yahweh Penave Lecha Vayasim Lecha Shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Yahweh is good.